Well, let's go home. That sort of said it all, didn't it? Don't have to add much to that. John 11, John, John chapter 11. This is Easter morning, as you know, and we're celebrating what I would call, and I think all would call, the greatest miracle um, ever, and probably the, the, great, the miracle with the greatest implications ever, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, miracles are a buzzword today. You'll find that in the argumentative community, the debating community between the atheists and the, the theists and the believers in God, they, they argue about one of the points of argument is the existence of miracles. How do we know, can we believe in miracles? Because miracles violate natural law. They do something that isn't normal. They do something that isn't natural. They're, they're called miracles. Miracles are simply God's intervention into a natural course of life. Now, our New Testament is full of miracles. None of them are more profound than the resurrection. And, I, and I, if I can be very honest and bold with you today, I think some of the claims of miracles today are, are just fabricated. I just don't know that they're even true. Um, and there needs to be verification. If someone's going to have a miracle, then we need to really see something. I had somebody went to a healing service, a pretty well-known evangelist one time, and, and, they, and they took empty wheelchairs and put them down the front of the church so people's faith would be built up. Yeah, I, it's one real miracle, and people's faith is pretty built up. So I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying we've got to be very careful. Because we get better from a sickness, we can claim a miracle, but don't use that term so cavalierly. Because that's a sacred term. A miracle means that God reached down from heaven and did something significant against all laws to make that happen. I'll use the story. I wasn't planning on saying about this, but I used it the first service. In 2001, in August, August 15th, I remember the day, my, my wife, Peggy, was, had, we, she was having medical issues and, and we didn't have health care at the point. I think we got health care and we got some blood work done and, and blood work led to some tests and some more tests and some drugs that they thought it was something that wasn't anything. And so finally they took a, another level of testing and they found her right or left kidney, I forget which one, was engrossed in a pretty good sized tumor. And it was pretty good size. I saw it. I saw it on a picture. It was an IVP test. There's a picture. And, and they were pretty concerned about it, that it, it was something that had spread into the rest of her body. So they planned a CAT scan to take the pictures of the rest of the body um, and to see if it had gone into any other organs at that point. We didn't tell anybody. We didn't want to tell anyone until we knew exactly what we were facing. So after a Wednesday night service, the day after we got the diagnosis, I prayed with my wife for 45 seconds. I simply prayed that God would release her from any bondage of fear, and both, both of us for that matter, that if God was going to take her home, we were going to have a spirit of grace um, to die. And, and as I done, got done praying for her, literally 45 seconds between um, preaching and seeing people after a message, she looked at me and said, it's gone. And I said, what's gone? She goes, I don't know. <laughs> she wasn't there. She just says, I just felt something come off me. Now, I'm a pretty natural guy. I eat grass. <laughs> I like dirt. I mean, I, I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not a fluffy guy. My wife's, we don't, we don't like to, is this like popping on me and everything? Should I switch to a regular mic, you think? All right, let me, let me do that. Let's cut. An Easter color. And the Yvette's going to sing with us later. She does a great job. So, so I, have, I, I look at uh, my wife, and, and, and we go back on Monday to get the test back at St. Anthony's Hospital to get the CAT scan. And so I'm driving. She takes the test. I'm driving home. The, the hospital calls me and says, can you come back and take another test? Because that one didn't, something went wrong on that one. And, of course, I turned around, went back, and didn't think much of it, really, at the point. And they took another picture. They took another picture. We went home, and our doctor's appointment, appointment with their urologist was on Thursday, but we knew we could pick up the CAT scan on noontime on Tuesday, and we weren't waiting for the doctor's appointment. So at noon on Tuesday, we arrive at St. Anthony's. I told my wife, go in there, grab the report, and bring it out to the car and so we can read it together. We had this great peace. I can't explain it, but it was a great peace. So she walks into the hospital, and she comes out um, with the report, and the first thing she did is start reading it without me. 
if he knew my wife, that would be a normal course of events for her. She starts reading it in the parking lot. I say, yeah, get over here. I need to read it with you. And so we get, we get the thing, and it says, a very unremarkable CAT scan, which sounded boring, but boring is good. In other words, there was nothing there. What they saw in the IVP test, which is they drink the stuff, they take the picture, and that's where they spoil it, wasn't there anymore. I have the IVP test in a file. I have the CAT scan in a file. So if anyone wants to say that didn't happen, I can say, well, I can actually show you the two tests one week apart to show you where it was there and then it wasn't there. We went to the urologist two days later, and she was an Indian doctor, a very sweet Dr. J. Julius Irving's urologist, how I remember her. Dr. J. used to go to her. And, um, and, and, um, and she just sort of looked at the picture. There, there it is. We're sitting in there. There's the, the picture from the IVP. There's the tumor. You can see it. It's just black. This big black thing. And there's the other kidneys fine. And there's a big black thing. And, there's, and she's reading the CAT scan. I didn't know how to read that because that's a bunch of little slices. And then she's looking at it. goes, it's not here. Can't find it. This, they almost look like two different kidneys, two different pictures. So they said, well, let's take the same test that we took to help get you to the doctors in the first place. There were certain things that would come up in her blood work that indicated that we had a problem. So they took another blood test that day, and, and we got the results a day or two later, and her blood was 100% absolutely normal. All symptoms disappeared too. That was a miracle. I can prove it's a miracle because I have the papers in there that tell us it was a miracle. In fact, I wrote that across the paper. This is a miracle. <laughs> and, and, and so, 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 there, go ahead. I, I cheer God on all the time about that. That's a real miracle. And, and I would eventually, if you have a real miracle, verify it. I can verify that one. Now, I say, I say all that. There is no greater miracle anywhere than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you say here this morning, well, I don't know if I really believe that. How do we know that's, a, that's even really happened? Well, let me present to you just a little bit of evidence, not the core of the message, but just a little bit of the evidence, because this evidence demands a verdict. It is hard to deny what I'm about to say without simply saying, I just don't want to believe it. Because that's the only way you can deny its validity. Number one. After the miracle, 12 encounters with people, with the Lord, with people after the miracle. 12 different encounters we can document that people saw the resurrected Christ. The most compelling of these is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, written about 20 years after Jesus died. 20 years post-resurrection. That's all, half a generation. The apostle Paul is writing, and he says basically 500 people saw the risen Lord. And some of them, many of them, are still alive today. So he writes this down, it gets circulated, but there are witnesses to verify what he said. 500 of them, most of them, some had died. Yeah, I was there, Paul's telling the truth. We saw him. Okay, well that's the church people promoting the church. Okay, I hear you. Um, Non-Christian historians, non-Christian, non-believers, historians, they're like newsmen of the day. Josephus and others, they wrote down and logged in, their, in, their, in their, their work that this Christian sect, there was an empty grave, and the, the followers of Christ claimed that he resurrected. So it was actually written down, and the Romans acknowledged that the grave was empty also. You don't believe any of that? Okay, one more. The disciples... The disciples, if you know the gospel story, what happened to Peter? He denied him three times. cock a doodle doo third time, he denies him. And, um, and, and, and all the other disciples forsook him, didn't they? The only one that hung out with him really was John a little bit and Mary. The rest of them, when, when, when he was arrested in the garden, they bolted because they realized they were in trouble. I wouldn't really call the disciples a courageous group. As soon as the going got tough and, and Jesus was a little less popular, they left. But then, after the resurrection, what happened to these men? And as you go through the book of Acts, they, they just preached the, world, the word boldly. 
In fact, if you follow the disciples' lives, Peter died saying, God, crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to be killed like my Lord. James was sawed in half. People were stabbed with spears. People were beheaded. The apostle Paul was beheaded, and he wasn't one of the original. What would cause these men to go to their grave and be tortured and be beaten and starved repetitively throughout the rest of their lives? Would they do that for something they made up? Would they do that for a fake? I think the answer is obviously no. William Lane Craig said this, a famous apologist, against the dark background of modern man's despair, the Christian proclamation of the resurrection is a bright light hope. If Jesus rose, then all of his claims are vindicated, and our Christian hope is sure. If Jesus did not rise, our faith is futile, and we fall back into despair. Now, who here can see their breath when they talk? When they, in other words, you're cold. All right. There you go. Yeah, that's better. You're cold, you're right? You're not cold. You got like, like, yeah, yeah, you get skin. I wouldn't call it that. You're much harsher on yourself than I would be. Louis Marco said this, the tomb was empty and the risen Christ appeared to many. That is the essence of the story and the central Christian claim. It is the message that the angel spoke to the frightened woman, a message that is over 2,000 years old and has not dulled altered or been destroyed. Marcos is an apologist. I know that because I just had to read his book for school. <laughs> and here's an old preacher from a couple generations ago. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the two fundamental truths of the gospel. The other being his atoning death. The crucifixion loses its meaning without the resurrection. And without the resurrection, the death of Christ was only the heroic death of a noble martyr. With the resurrection... It's the atoning death of the Son of God. Now, in John chapter 11, without reading the whole chapter, paraphrasing, Jesus had a wonderful relationship with Mary, Martha, and, and um, Lazarus in, in the city, little city of Bethany. And so what happened is Jesus was two or three miles away, however, however exactly far it was, and, and Lazarus became sick, uh, very sick unto death. So the sisters run to see Jesus, and they said, Jesus, Lazarus is sick unto death. Come, because they knew Jesus could heal him. And Jesus looked at him and said, listen, I'm, he's going to be healed. He will not die unto the glory of God, I promise you. And so they ran home all happy because they had the Lord's promise. He was going to come and heal them. But Jesus didn't follow them right away. He waited four days. He waited four days, and so Lazarus actually died. So then after four days, he starts heading home. He starts heading back to Bethany, and he's met on the road by Mary and Martha, by one of them. So let me, let me pick up the story in verse 25. This is Martha. Jesus told her, I am, I, I am the resurrection and the life, and anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Remember that verse. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she turned to Mary, then she returned to Mary, and, and she called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. And Jesus had stayed outside the village at a place where Martha met him when the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Jesus arrived and saw Jesus, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Little guilt. Now, this is intriguing to me, these next few verses. And Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her. Look what this says. A deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. That's very good language, very good translation from the Greek. A deep anger, he was angry, welled up in him, 
and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. And the shortest verse in the Bible, two words in the King James, verse 35, then Jesus wept. So he was angry, then he wept. I don't think they're disconnected. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved them? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? And Jesus was still angry when he arrived, when he arrived at the tomb, a, a cave with a stone rolled across his entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Amen. That would be stinketh in the King James. If you're a King James guy, that's, that's King James, stinketh. Um, Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside, and Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud this time for the sake of these people standing here. So they will believe that you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in graves clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. And many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. Wow. So I want to get to why did Jesus weep in a moment, but just a few thoughts first. Because I didn't see any commentators write anything about this at all. So I think I'm the first one exploring this potential possibility. What about Lazarus? Was he ever given a choice? <laughs> Guys, I'm joking. I mean, <laughs> so, some of you are like, so, oh, I don't know. I, I'm just... Uh, <laughs> Come on, I'm just kidding, the guys. I just, I imagine Lazarus going into the grave. He's down there. We know he probably went to Abraham's bosom. That's the best we can tell. He went to Abraham's bosom like Jesus did when he died. He went, descended, and, and went to this place called paradise. And here's Lazarus. He's there for, he goes, a day passes. I'm not sure they have days. Or ever once he's down there. And then, I don't know when he got the word. Maybe when he arrived, they said, you know, don't unpack you're going back, you just, you're here for a few days, then you're going back. So just you know, you know, keep, keep yourself sort of um, close to the gate here, Lazarus. Of course, Peter wasn't at the gate yet. He hadn't died yet. And so, so, so here's Lazarus' mind. I'm thinking he's in paradise. I, uh, don't I? Can't I choose? I want to go back. My sisters fight. Um, there's no running water. I don't need running water here. Um, there's this pretty dirty um, here and it's um, on earth in Palestine during this day. It's open sewer and here I am in paradise with Abraham and David and Moses and Samuel and all the great heroes of the faith and my mom and my dad and my brothers and, my, and all my family members. I'm, I'm here and you want me to go back. Why do I need to go back? But I'll stink if I go back. <laughs> Lazarus is a purpose. For the glory of God, you have to go back. <laughs> Life comes back into his human body again. Why did Jesus weep? Well, maybe the first question we should ask is in verse 33. Why did Jesus have deep anger? Why was he moved so deeply? with anger towards the mourning crowd, the people grieving the loss of Lazarus. Now, there's a couple in my research, there's been two main reasons why people say this. In fact, I didn't find one commentator to really give the reason why I'm gonna, why I'm gonna give for it today, but I think I'm right on this. I'm not sure I'm not the only one that's ever come up with this, but the first and main reason you'll say, or the, I say that one of the reasons they'll say is he wept at people's, um, because of people's lack of faith. He looked at people's lack of faith, and he's bawling because, I can't believe they didn't believe. Well, I, I, just to, not that that couldn't have been a, a motivation there, but just let's think this through a little bit. Um, up until this point, no one's ever resurrected. 
Now, up to this point, no one's ever saw somebody come out of a grave. Death was a pretty final thing. When there was a burial, it was, it was a, a semblance of the end of a relationship, the end of a life on earth. They understood an afterlife, but the life on earth ended at death. And J Jesus knew that, and he knew that the people on earth, the people that were in front of him, all understood that, and, and that was a settled conclusion in the human race, that when death happened, it was final, at least physically. So I would say, Jesus probably said, you know, what's, what's he going to expect? If I was Jesus, I would expect them, because it was final. They didn't really know I was going to bring them forth. So I don't know if I really believe that's the reason why he was so angry at people's lack of faith. Some people others believe that he was moved by the grieving of his friends. And, and I sort of believe that that's at least partially true, I believe. In other words, they say that he was, he was moved inside. He wept because he saw the tears of Mary and Martha and all the people that loved this family and their weeping. He was moved by that. And that is, I think, at least partially true, part of the, the, the real answer. But again, my, my reason why I think it's bigger than that is because he knew that in a matter of seconds, they'd be rejoicing. He knew in a matter of moments, they'd be on their face worshiping and thanking God for the miracle of miracles, watching Lazarus come forth from the grave. So I think the emotions of Jesus had to be a little bit more profound or at least maybe something different than that. Now, I believe the answer is simply a testimony of Jesus' divine nature in the fact that he knew that God created man with great dignity and great authority. He knew, Jesus knew that when God conceived man in creation and God breathed life into dust that made you and I, he knew that we were not created for pain we weren't made for pain. We were not created for suffering. We were not made for loss. We were not made for heartache. We were not made for mental illness, loneliness, self-consciousness, lust, addictions, fear, wounded hearts and wounded emotions. We weren't created for that. That was an invasion of a fallen nature. That was an invasion of sin that came into the human race. But that was not God's original design. It's not what he intended for you and I and how he intended for you and I to live. Listen, we weren't created to die. We were created to live. We weren't created to mourn. We were created to rejoice. We weren't created to grieve. We were created to have joy. So when Jesus looks at the human race, I believe his anger, if I can just presume a little bit, was directed more at the devil than anything else. Because it was the deception of the serpent that brought this, this disease of death into the human race. Yeah, Adam, Adam and Eve had to go along with it. Adam and Eve had to cooperate and I believe, my friends, that's the message of Easter. And that's the message of this passage. I believe there's a message of hope. Because God breathed in us a life that was never supposed to live in the squalor of time and space. Do I have to convince anyone that it's difficult sometimes? It's great that we all live lives that don't know stress. It's great that we never have disease. I love the fact that none of us have ever said goodbye to somebody we love. We know that's all folly. The older you live, the more you say goodbye. The older you live, the more the doctor's reports become a little bit more scary. The more you live and you walk, you realize, you know, I, I just don't have this figured out. And you realize pain is real and not make-believe. The writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 8 when David talked about the dignity of man and creation. Let me write, read the Hebrew portion of it because he brings it into a New Testament state of mind. For in one place, verse 6 of Hebrews 2, 
A scripture says, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Talking about God. Or the son of man that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made. So he looked at men. You made them a little lower than the angels, but you crowned them, you and I, the created beings, breathed on by God, the object of his affections. You crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things. Now, when I say all things, he, def he defines it. This is actually pretty good. It's like a commentary within a commentary. It means nothing is left out. We have not yet seen all things put under their authority. What we do see, what we do see is Jesus, who was given a position a little lower than the angels. Because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. So why did Jesus weep? I don't think it's that complicated. Jesus, knowing how God made us, knowing how God created us, he saw the ravages of human sin and the ravages of, an, of a folly on a human folly on a human race. He saw death. He saw funerals that were never supposed to happen. He saw tears shed and great grief and great sorrow that was never supposed to happen. Death was never intended to be. We weren't meant to grieve. We were never supposed to live in unbroken fellowship with our Heavenly Father. He was mad because there was grief on earth. There was heartache on earth. There was death on earth. And there shouldn't have been. It didn't have to be. There was loss on earth. There was saying goodbye amongst families on earth. And it didn't have to be. He knew it wasn't God's best. He knew addiction wasn't God's best. He knew he didn't create us to be lonely. He knew he didn't make us to be sad. He knew he didn't mean us to feel like we didn't have any value or any worth. He knew that. He saw the folly and the ravages of sin on the human race. He says, no, this isn't how God, this isn't how my father meant it. He didn't mean it this way. He never intended it for this. And I'm about to do something about it. Couldn't stop what happened in the Garden of Eden thousands of years ago, but I can sure fix it. I'm going to go to a cross. I'm going to die. And in that death, I'm going to reconcile this race to my Father. That whosoever believes on him should never perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to reconcile the human race to my Father, God. And then, three days after I died, I'm going to resurrect I'm taking death back. And I'm freeing the race from its grips. They will no longer be under his dominion and his tyranny. Verse 14. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son, Jesus, also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who live their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. My friends, I can't, we can't stop dying. It's just going to happen. But boy, the fear can go. The grip can go. The intrepid walk can go. Because so I don't know when Jesus is coming back, hopefully in the next second. <laughs> hopefully. Or well, maybe after lunch would be nice. But, but I, someday soon, Jesus comes and he calls. It's like he did Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He's going to say the same thing to Tim Kelly. If the Lord tarries, Tim Kelly, come forth. Put your name into that statement. Come forth. The tyranny of sin is over. Death has lost its sting. You are no longer under its authority. I've freed you from it. You're a free man. 
It'll all be over. We're going home. The fear of death is gone. The sting of death is gone. The pain of death is gone. The heartache of death is gone. The disillusionment of death is gone. The separation of death is gone. My friends, I live here. This is my message. I hang on to it. Know the word hope? Know what it means? Elpis is the Greek word. and It means to have a, an expectation of something in the future you fully expect to realize. Amen. That's hope. Hope in the English is, is we hope something good happens. I hope I win the lottery. I hope you all win the lottery. And I won't say any more. It's Easter. <laughs> And I, I, hope, I, hope we, I hope you all win it. I, I do. And, and I hope you, you feel generous once you, once you do. I hope those are, those are hopes. Do I think you're going to win? No, I don't. But, but feel free. Try. And, um, and, um, and do I think? No, but that's not, that's not a biblical hope. A biblical hope is, no, this is mine. It's 100%. I haven't realized it yet, but this is mine. I have a hope of eternal life. I have a hope that those people I've said goodbye to will be waiting for me. And when I reunite with them, I will never, ever have to say goodbye again. I hang on to that. Hang on to the fact that your life is bigger than something right here and right now. That's what the resurrection means. It's a message of living for something higher than myself. Can I say that again? It's a message of living for something higher than just myself. That life that just evolves around me. It's me. It's me. It's all about me. This person loves me. They don't love me. I'm good. So I'm, whatever it is, it's, you're the center of your own universe. That's an unresurrected message. The resurrection makes you about something much bigger, something higher. There's a message of power in resurrection life, and that power of resurrection isn't just future, even though that is true. The resurrected future is beyond imagination, 1 Corinthians 2.9. Beyond what we could ever imagine or dream. But the moment the Holy Spirit entered your life, resurrection life entered you also. That's life for now, real life, real pain, real stuff. There is no enemy on earth that this miracle can't defeat. My friends, that's Easter. You hear the word hope thrown around pretty easy, and, it's, um, and it should be. It's a great word. The hope of the resurrection is true. If you don't believe it happened, pay the price of study. You'll conclude that, you know, it's true. Logically, logically, it's illogical to think it's not true. It's true. And if it's true, and Jesus did rise from the dead, echoing Paul's sentiment in 1 Corinthians 15, where he said, if Jesus didn't rise, we're of all men most miserable. But he did rise, so we are of all men most joyful and of all men most hopeful. Dear Jesus, thank you.